everyone. Welcome back. I am the Electrical Code Coach. I'm super excited about this video series that we're bringing you. We're bringing you an eight-part electric vehicle charging masterclass. We're going to be launching it every Friday for the next nine weeks. And then at the end of the video series, we're going to put it all together in one video for you as a masterclass that you can keep. Our bargain is, is that we will add value to you, and then you will in turn go out and add value into others. Over this masterclass, we're going to be covering EV charging basics. You know, just some of the parts and components, the different, you know, slang terminologies and the field terms that we're using when we're installing these. What is EV charging? And we're also going to answer the question, can our grid handle all of these electric vehicles? Because that's a term that we're hearing thrown around is that the grid just can't handle it. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about the EV charging definitions from the National Electrical Code Book. We're going to look at the definitions that they have listed here in 625. And the reason is, is that we, if we don't clearly define what we're talking about, it'll be, it'll be hard for us to understand the code book and then to convey it to someone else. We're going to talk about equipment construction. How long is the cord required to be? What about ventilation? All of these different things. We're going to talk about sizing branch circuits and overcurrent protection. So we're going to learn how to size our wire for these. And then at the same time, that's going to dictate the size pipe that we use, the, the fittings and so on. We're also going to talk about overcurrent protection for these devices, while at the same time learning how to calculate the loads for these. So when we go to install them, we're not overloading our system. You know, do they need a service upgrade before we even install this car charger? Are we going to be required to put in a smaller car charger because of this load calculation? And then finally, we're going to talk about the installation of electric vehicle charging receptacles and stations. All these things that we're going to be learning over these eight weeks ultimately have to come to fruition, don't they? They have to come out in an installation. So I want us to be able to put all of this knowledge together and then be able to put rubber to the road and be able to go out and actually physically install these. I am the Electrical Code Coach, and I've dedicated my life to help you become everything that you can be in life and in the electrical industry. Hey, y'all. Welcome back. I am the Electrical Code Coach. I'm super excited about this week's video. We're continuing in our master class. This week, we're going to be learning about EV charging basics. Let's get to it. All right, so let's dive right into it. The first thing we need to learn with EV charging basics is how these vehicles are powered. Electric vehicles are powered by DC current. That's the same direct current that we all know and love, powering our tools, cell phones, flashlights, all of the other things that we have learned to use over the years. It's very consistent, very reliable, although it does have its limitations. Electric vehicles are powered by two different battery systems. Let's take a look at the electrical code coach mobile. So the first battery system that most cars are powered by is going to be your standard 12 volt car battery. The one that we're used to all seeing in our cars. It's going to be located here in the front, maybe in the back or somewhere else in the vehicle. Now, one thing I want to note is every electrical vehicle is different and this thing is evolving very quickly. This 12 volt battery system is going to run things like your headlights, your car chargers, your windows, all of the things that cars currently run off of 12 volts. They've adapted into the electric vehicles. And the reason is, is that it's, it's tried and true, isn't it? It's proven. It's a proven system, and you can truly get a lot of work done with a 12-volt DC system. The second battery system in our electric vehicle is going to be in the 3 to 800-volt range, depending on your make and model. It's going to look something like this, depending on your vehicle. In the Code Coach Mobile, this is the skateboard, you know, setup. They call it, this is going to be laying in the floor. One day they might line them with the sides. One day the battery might be so small it might be the size of a 9-volt battery. We have no idea. But it's going to be in all different types of configurations. And this is what's going to be running your drivetrain. So this is going to be how we actually are able to go so fast with so much torque. Some of these new modern vehicles have the same torque as some of the Challengers, but it's in an electric vehicle. This battery system is also going to run things like your air conditioning or compressor. Anything that needs a large load or starting capacity, it's going to run those and that's going to vary from model to model. Now that we understand that our electric vehicle is powered by DC power, let's learn about how it's charged. There are four main types of charging. There is AC level one charging, AC level two charging, DC level one charging, and DC level two charging, which is often called level three charging, but we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. Let's look at AC level one charging. 
So AC level one charging is going to be your typical 120 volt receptacle setup. It's very convenient because they're everywhere on commercial buildings, in your apartment complex. They're all over and very easy to find. The drawback is, is that it's very slow, painfully slow to charge your electric vehicle, but it's better than nothing. They often come with your electrical vehicle. You can probably pick them up at your big box store and you can definitely order them at places like Amazon. You do have to be very careful that you get a trusted brand with any electrical component. Make sure that it's UL or ETL listed and that it has great reviews. You do not want to go Rasco or cheap or used on any type of electrical equipment, you want to make sure that it is high quality. This is your investment. This is your home. This is your family. This is your livelihood. AC level two charging is going to be something like this. You may also see something like this out at the grocery store, out at Publix, out at Kroger. And these are going to be level two charging. It's AC current, and it's going to allow you to charge your vehicle up to nine times faster, depending on the configuration. These are often installed by a licensed electrician. They are higher voltages and also higher amperages. We're going to learn later in this masterclass how to size these so we don't overload our entire electrical system for our residence or commercial building. DC level one charging is going to be at a lower capacity, and this is not the level three charging that everyone is talking about. But DC level two charging is. It's actually called DC fast charging, and it's not called level three charging. I'm cool if you want to call it that, but it's actually called DC level two charging. Now, DC level two charging is going to utilize these ports right here on your vehicle and on your you know, charging setup. We're going to learn all about this connector here in just a few moments, and we're going to understand the difference between AC and DC charging when it comes to charging our vehicle. Obviously, the greatest advantage of using level two DC uh, fast charging is that it's going to be much quicker and we get to bypass the conversion from AC to DC. We're going straight DC to DC and that's going to allow us the fastest charge times and less moving parts when it comes to charging these pieces of equipment. Now that we understand that our car is powered by DC, could be potentially charged by AC, let's talk about how those two connect together. So how can we take AC power from the wall and plug it into our standard receptacle and we're going to talk about the j1772 receptacle and charger which is the standard for most vehicles besides tesla we're going to talk about how it can take that ac power and turn it into dc power to charge the vehicle and that's going to be done through the onboard charging module one of the ports is going to be for your ac input and one of them is going to be for your dc output now what this has to do is bring the ac power in it has to convert it over to DC and step the voltage up. So there's a lot of moving parts like I was talking about before. Now when we do the DC level two fast charging, then you're going to be allowed to do DC to DC charging. These systems are going to expand and I look for it to be the standard. You know, one day it'll all be DC fast charging, but they're taking utility power that is AC converting it over to DC for you, stepping up the voltage for you, and then you plug it directly in, and that allows you to charge much quicker and more efficiently. Now, let's learn about the actual J1772 charging port. Almost all electric vehicles in the United States use the J1772 connection setup. It's going to look like this. With the exception of Tesla, Tesla has their own proprietary connector. But thankfully, you can buy an adapter that will allow you to go from Tesla to the J1772. Let's talk about the setup for the J1772. On the far right-hand side, if you're facing it, is going to be where line one connects. So you will take your J1772 and plug it in here, and this is going to line up with line one from the charger. I do want to note that these chargers over here are doing very little. They're a very expensive switch. Almost all of the communication is going to be in between the computer system on the electric vehicle with the onboard charging module in between these two communication ports right here. That's going to control how much to charge, when to charge, and all these different aspects. This is really doing very little, and they charge a lot for what it does. So the second port on this is going to be line two if you're doing a 208 or a 240 volt setup, or it's going to be neutral if you're doing 120 volts and you're doing level one charging.
This port here is going to be your equipment grounding conductor. That's also going to bond the chassis, the frame of the electric vehicle, bond all its components. So if in the event of a fault, it would hopefully go back to the source and clear the fault, just like a normal equipment grounding conductor should. This is going to be the charge controller and communication. So this is going to communicate back and forth on these low voltage, I think they're 30 volts, low voltage, and it's going to communicate back and forth telling, you know, the charger on the wall to pour on the coal or to back it off or to stop charging altogether. This other port over here is going to do other functions as well, but the main thing that it does is it works in conjunction with the lever here. So when you go to disconnect it from the vehicle, if it is charging, we have to rapidly shut that down so we're not breaking a load. As we disconnect this cord, when you push that button, it communicates with it to shut down the charge immediately so we do not have that gap and have that spark. Here is going to be the negative terminal for DC fast charging, and this is going to be the positive terminal for DC fast charging. So this week we've covered some of the basics. Next week we're going to dive deep into the definitions that are listed in Article 625, because if we don't understand some of these definitions going forward, when we start talking about installing, we're not going to know how to talk about it and how to be able to convey it to others our installers or our customers, or even just understand it intellectually ourselves. Hey everyone, welcome back. I am the Electrical Code Coach. I'm super excited to continue with you in this electric vehicle masterclass. This week, we're going to be diving into the NEC EV code definitions, because if we don't understand the definitions and the terminology, we're not going to be able to have an intelligent conversation with someone. At the same time, we're not really going to be able to understand how to install or what we're doing when we're installing if we're missing some of these key terms. So we're going to literally go through every single definition. This week, we're going to go through a handful, and next week, we're going to go through a handful. I'm going to be reading from the 2017 NEC. You can also follow along inside of the 2020. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Cable Management System. An apparatus designed to control and organize the output cable to the electric vehicle or to the primary pad. And this is what we're talking about right here. It's anything that helps you manage the cable. And this is a system. This is another one here, whether it's retracting, holding, or this third one here. I love this one. Let me get my pointer out. So just to help you make out what this picture is, this would be like the side of your garage wall. And instead of having your cable lay across the floor while it charges, it actually helps manage the cable up through the air and it holds it here on this cool holster. So when you plug your vehicle in, the cable is running through the air and not just running across the floor of your garage. So regardless of what you're using it for, if it helps you manage, deal with the cable, it's going to be part of the cable management system. Now let's talk about the charger power converter. This is a big one and this is a little bit futuristic, but the future is here and now. This device is used to convert energy from the power grid to a high frequency output for wireless power transfer. And this is when Nikola Tesla would be doing backflips. This is exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about taking power, taking it, cranking the uh, frequency up and wirelessly charging electric vehicles. And the ultimate dream, right? Now, whether it will ever happen, we'll find out. But the ultimate dream is that you could charge your vehicle while driving down the road and that there's strips inside of the road and they keep your vehicle charged while you're driving. So essentially you'd never have to stop until, of course, you needed an Osco drink or had to use the bathroom. So this is the charger power converter. Electric vehicle, an automotive type vehicle for on-road use, such as passenger automobiles, buses, trucks, fans, neighborhood electric vehicles electric motorcycles, and the like. Primarily powered by an electric motor that draws current from a rechargeable storage battery, fuel cell, or photo photovoltaic array, or other sources of electric current. Plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, PHEVs, are considered electric vehicles. For the purpose of this article, off-road, self-propelled electric vehicles, such as industrial trucks, hoists, lifts, transports, golf carts, Airline ground support equipment, tractors, boats, and the like are not included. So basically what we're talking about is anything that is made for on-road use that is powered by an electric motor. It could be buses, could be uh, you know motorcycles, could be cars, could be trucks. My favorite one in this list was 
neighborhood electric vehicles. I think what they mean is, you know, buses or transit things that are used inside of neighborhoods. But I just thought that was a funny part of the definition. It says neighborhood electric vehicles. I thought that was really cool. So that is the definition of electric vehicle. The next three definitions we're going to do all together because they're so closely related. Electric vehicle connector, electric vehicle coupler, and electric vehicle inlet. I'm going to read the definitions, then we'll talk about it. Electric vehicle connector. A device that, when electrically coupled, conductive or inductive, to an electric vehicle inlet, establishes an electrical connection to the electric vehicle for the purpose of power transfer and information exchange. This device is part of the electric vehicle coupler. Now we're going to jump down to electric vehicle inlet, then we'll come back and read the electric vehicle coupler. So let's read electric vehicle inlet. The device that on an electric vehicle into which the electric vehicle connector is electrically coupled, whether conductive or inductive, for power transfer and for information exchange. This device is a part of the electric vehicle coupler. For the purpose of this code, the electric vehicle inlet is considered to be part of the electric vehicle and not part of the electric vehicle supply equipment. All right, so let's just break this down super simple. We're not even going to go, I'll read it just for fun because it almost cracks me up, but let's read now the definition in between the two. It says electric vehicle coupler. A mating electric vehicle inlet and electric vehicle connector set. Let's just simplify this. This is the connector. This is the inlet. And when you mate the two together, it's called a coupling. It's when you couple it. It's an electric vehicle coupler. So. Connector, inlet, when they're together, they're coupled. Pretty simple. Electric vehicle storage battery. A battery comprised of one or more rechargeable electrochemical cells that has no provision for the release of excess gas pressure during normal charging and operation, or for the addition of water or electrolyte for external measurements of electrolyte-specific gravity. Not to overcomplicate this, it's the sealed battery that is going to be, like we learned about last week, going to be used for your drivetrain on your electric vehicle. Remember, there's two types of battery systems we've learned on our EV. One of them is the 12 volt system that's running our lights, locks, doors, and windows, and things like that. Then there's this one, which is a sealed component battery, which is going to be used to store the larger charge of three to 800 volts, depending on our model, that we're going to be used to power the drivetrain, the air conditioning, or anything else that would require a large load. So this is the electric vehicle storage battery. Electric vehicle supply equipment. Now, this is a pretty broad definition, just like the National Electrical Code's definition for electrical equipment, which could really include anything. This is a little bit more specific because it has only to do with the transferring of energy. Let's talk about it. The conductors, including ungrounded, grounded, and equipment grounding conductors, the electric vehicle connectors, attachment plugs, and all other fittings, devices, power outlets, or apparatuses installed specifically for the purpose of transferring energy between the premises wiring and the electric vehicle. So what it's talking about, a broad definition of anything that has to do with transferring the power from the premise, premises all the way to the vehicle, including the conductors, which would mean the conductors in any of the cables. It would also include all the fittings, all the pieces, and anything that it takes to make this happen. It's going to include all of that equipment. Now let's do these next two definitions together, and it's going to include fastened in place and fixed in place. I'm going to read them both, then we can talk about it a little bit. Fixed in, or fastened in place. Mounting means of an EVSE, which is electric vehicle supply equipment, in which the fastening means are specifically designed to permit periodic removal for relocation, interchangeability, maintenance, or repair without use of a tool. Fixed in place. Mounting means of EVSE, which again is electric vehicle supply equipment, so any of the equipment to do with supplying in between the premise wiring and the vehicle. If it's fixed in place, it's attached to the wall or surface with fasteners that require a tool to remove it. So just to simplify this a little bit, regardless of what we're talking about, if it's fastened in place, it does not need a tool to require the maintenance to move. If it's 
fixed in place, it does require a tool. So this is really like splitting hairs here. Like, what are we talking about? It could make a difference in the manufacturing, whether it's fastened or fixed in place. It also could make a difference if certain things inside of this code in 625, maybe some are required to be fastened in place and some are required to be fixed in place. You know, you might look at the NEC definition of accessible and readily accessible and be like, you know, do we really need these? But we do. You know, GSCI protection has to be readily accessible, while a junction box could be 35 foot in the air and require a boom lift. And I do think that there is a need for both. So I don't know the practical need for the difference between fastened and fixed in place when it comes to EV, SE, the actual supply equipment, but I'm sure to someone it means the world. And if you're that person, please drop it down in the comments below. If you're like me, I was super hesitant to get on the EV train, if you will wasn't really interested, thought it might be a fad, thought it might not be affordable for the masses, but all of those things now are happening here. It is affordable, it is staying, and it's definitely not a fad. So with that being said, I'm starting to get excited about them now, but it's not for the reason that you might think. I'm not getting excited about ever owning one, but staying ahead of the electrical curve. And that's my bargain here today is that this video series will add value to you and you will in turn add value to others. Because if we can get ahead of the curve, we can be a part of the fruit when it happens. Now you may be a part of the first wave and it's already happening in your area and that's exciting. But for most of us in the country, it's just now getting ready to come on. And I want you guys to be so sharp ahead of the game. I want you to be, just be a pro when you walk out. When you start getting these phone calls, you'll be like, absolutely, we can do the install. Not only will it be lucrative for you, but it will allow you to serve your customer on that level that I know deep down you want to. So we're going to continue this week in 625.2. We're looking at the definitions, and the reason is is we're laying the foundation for our career in EV electric vehicle installations. If we don't understand the terminology, we're never going to be able to convey it to the homeowner in a way that they can understand or to our installer to get the job done. So we really need to understand the different parts and components. Now let's go ahead and jump into where we left off last week. We left off with fixed in place, and we're going to continue with output cable to the electric vehicle. An assembly consisting of a length of flexible EV cable and an electric vehicle connector supplying power to the electric vehicle. I love this week's lesson. All of these definitions are really basic or are building on some of the previous definitions. But let's go ahead and look through them all. So whether we're coming from AC or DC input, Coming over to the electric vehicle, this cable right here is what we're talking about. This is the cable. This is the output cable to the electric vehicle. Now let's look at the output cable to the primary pad. A multi-conductor shielded cable assembly consisting of conductors can, to carry the high frequency energy and any status signals in between the charger, power, converter, and the primary pad. Remember this picture from last week, the charge controller over here, converting it to the high frequency, transforming it to the higher frequency. This is the primary pad. This is going to be the secondary pad or receiver, however you want to look at it. This definition is talking about this cable right here. And I would assume that this cable has to be made up of a special sheath. And the reason I say that is it's going to be put out at a higher frequency. We definitely do not want this causing any interference in our home business or you know, other technologies, or also in the electric vehicle. Now let's talk about the personnel protection system. I'm gonna read the definition and we're gonna talk about it. A system of personnel protection devices and constructional features that when used together provide protection against electric shock of personnel. Now, I think primarily this is talking about the construction methods of the equipment at the factory and in their design. But in my opinion, I think we all are a part of this personnel protection system. Anytime the code book is talking about a system, it's talking about the different fittings, components, installation methods, and standards that end up with the end result. And in this case, the end result is to protect against electric shock of personnel. So in my opinion, not only these fittings right here on the connector, or the cable itself and its construction and its jacket and all of their requirements, the requirements of the pad, whether or not it has GFCI protection, 
whether or not this pad has been grounded to a grounding electrode system or established its own out at this location. I think, in my opinion, even the wiring that is coming to it and whether or not it is properly protected, you know, with overcurrent. So in my opinion, it's not just the construction methods. It's everyone pitching in to create this protection system for personnel. I think we all have a part of it. So a good example is if you're out there and you're doing an install and you notice a frayed cable or you notice a faulty connector, I think we're all a part of this, being cognizant of what's going on, what we're looking at, and making sure that the install is safe. And the reason this install has to be taken to the next level is it's the only time that I can think of that a homeowner is dealing directly with 240 volts or 208 or whatever your system is in whatever country you're in. So we have homeowners who are dealing directly with a 240 volt cable. So we need this installation to be rock solid. I mean, think about it. It doesn't matter if it's a range, hot tub, water heater, a homeowner never deals with any cable that is directly 240 volt rated. And not only now are they dealing with it every day, they're dealing with it in public, they're dealing it with dealing with it in their home, it's laying in their garage floor. And there may be different things that stop the you know, you know, flow of current at different points in the system that make it safer. But while that thing's plugged in, there's a 240 volt current and that cord may be laying on the floor. So we need to take this install to the next level. And that's why I think we all have our part in the personnel protection system. You can drop what you think down in the comments below. Now let's take a look at the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle or PHEV, a type of electric vehicle intended for on-road use with the ability to store and use off-vehicle electrical energy in the rechargeable energy storage system and having a second source of motive power. So if we look at this car here, it has the electric batteries, but it also has some other type of fuel source in the front. And this is actually the true hybrid vehicle. This is not like the hybrid vehicles that are a gas vehicle, but use some regenerative technologies, you know, to offset things. These are truly electric vehicles with gas motors. So you can charge it just like an electric vehicle and you can run it just like a gas motor or some other fuel source. It doesn't have to be gas to be in a, a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Now, it's one of those things where I look for this technology to be around for a little while because if you have a gas motor, you have all the things that come with a gas motor. You have the coolant system. You have the exhaust system. You have all of the other things it takes to run a motor and all of the things that it takes to run an electric vehicle. So these vehicles primarily use their battery system, and then if they either need more torque, more power, they'll kick in the gas motor, or if you just run low on battery, they will kick in the gas motor. So like I said, these are around right now. I do not look for them to be around forever. All right, so the next one is super simple, but I think we need to cover it. It says portable as applied to ESVE. And remember, ESVE is short for Electric Vehicle Supply Equipment. It says, portable, a device intended for indoor or outdoor use that can be carried from charging location to charging location as designated to be transported in the vehicle when not in use. And in my opinion, it would include these type chargers and a, maybe even a charger like this. So this is something that's portable. Going back to fixed and fastened in place. It's going to be the opposite of those. These are portable. You can throw them in the trunk. You can pull them back out at the next charging place. You can, like this unit here on the right, excuse me, on the right-hand side, you can use it anywhere, okay? You could take it with you and get a, this one's called Spark Charge. I should have threw a Code Coach tag on it for a little extra fun. But these are going to be portable as applied to ESVE. Power supply cord. Now, this seems awful familiar to the output cable, but it is different. This is actually going to be the power supply cord, which once you look at it like that, it seems very intuitive, doesn't it? This is going to be the output cable to the electric vehicle. This is going to be the power supply cord to the AC or DC or whatever system you're on. And let's look at the primary pad. We've learned about this previously, but we have the charge controller here. We have the Output cable to the primary pad. This is going to be our primary pad. This is the energy flowing in between. This is going to be our secondary pad here, and this is going to be charging our battery wirelessly. Let's look at another really basic one. Rechargeable energy storage system. 
I love this definition. It says any power source that has the capability to be charged and discharged. So this would include the 12 volt system that's running our locks and you know windows. This would also include the 300 to 800 volt system that's running the drivetrain. It also would include technically anything that can be charged and discharged. So pretty broad definition. And I really like when there's things like that in the NEC. The next one is wireless power transfer. And to me, this is probably the coolest thing about electric vehicles, period. I really hope that they can bring it to the market in a way that we can all use it and in some of the ways that they're pitching it. So back to this drawing right here. So coming from the charge controller, higher frequency from the primary pad over here to the secondary pad, charging the battery. So this wireless transfer here is the definition. It's a wireless power transfer. Let's, let's read the definition. The transfer of electrical energy from a power source to an electrical load via electric and magnetic fields or waves by a contactless inductive means between a primary and a secondary device. So whether you call it a secondary pad, what it's saying is from the primary device to the secondary device, it is a wireless transfer of energy. And this is one of my favorite parts, you know, about the whole thing. And, you know, just the, the thought of be, maybe being able to drive down the road and they charge while you're driving down the road. It's pretty awesome. And the last one is wireless power transfer equipment. Let's read the definition. Equipment consisting of a charger power converter and a primary pad. The two devices are either separate units or contained within one enclosure. So this is what we're talking about here. Same thing. This is just saying the equipment. The equipment that it takes to make the wireless power transfer is going to be the wireless power transfer equipment. So if somebody says, hey, I'm talking about wire power wireless power transfer equipment, you know they're either talking about the primary pad, the charge controller, the secondary pad, or one of the components in between, including the output cable to the primary pad, and any other things that they invent in the future that are going to go in between or work with this system. So really the sky's the limit with EV, and I'm super excited about it. Hey everyone, welcome back. I am the Electrical Code Coach. Really excited about this week's video. We're going to be diving into week five of our Electrical Vehicle Charging Masterclass. I want to point something out from last week. I accidentally misspoke and said ESVE instead of EVSE for Electric Vehicle Supply Equipment. Although I know intellectually that it's EVSE. If I ever have a typo on the screen and don't catch it, I just read what's on the screen. So when we go back to regroup and make this one long video of this masterclass, I'll make sure that we get it corrected. This week, we're going to be dealing with equipment construction for EVSE, electric vehicle supply equipment. And I know you may say, coach, listen, this is for manufacturers. This is for their construction. This doesn't have anything to do with us. If you'll give me just a few minutes of time, I assure that this part of the course will also add value to you. The main focus this week is going to be 110.3b. I'm going to go ahead and read it. It says, listed or labeled equipment shall be installed and used in accordance with any instructions include, included in the listing or labeling. What it's saying, guys, is that, listen, every piece of equipment has a set of manufacturer's instructions. We have to install it, not only according to the NEC, not only according to local ordinances, but to the manufacturer's instructions that are listed and labeled by companies like UL and ETL. And the reason is, is that that manufacturer has designed that product around those instructions or vice versa has designed their instructions around that product to meet their specifications of construction. So it's super important when we're doing our install that we follow that. You'll say, ah, I don't ever use instructions and that's fine for someone who's not an electrician. And if you're wanting to be a master electrician, if you want to be a master electrician, you absolutely have to understand the value of looking at these instructions. Now, I pray nothing ever happens to any of your work where you have to end up in court. But if you were to install an electric vehicle charger and something were to happen to that install, and listen, you may be a master electrician already and say that would never happen to me. And maybe with normal electrical work, it wouldn't. But I want you to think about General Motors and their recall that they had recently where they wouldn't even let people charge their vehicles inside their house because they were worried about fire. So let's say you do a rock solid install and something happens to that vehicle has nothing to do with you. I assure you when it goes to court, you're going to be in there. You, the inspector, make sure you pull a permit. It's super important. 
you, the inspector, and maybe a representative from General Motors are going to be in that courtroom. But I guarantee you, regardless of who's in the courtroom, the lawyer and the judge and everyone involved are going to have a photocopy of the manufacturer's instructions. And they're going to say, Mr. Electrician, did you see this in the manufacturer's instructions? Did you see this? Did you install it? And if you say the words, what instructions, I assure you they've got you right there on the spot. Now, I just want you to be protected. I want you to have a long career. And I do want you to ultimately be a master electrician. But we have to be super careful in the litigious society that we live in. So this whole time today and everything to deal with EVs, just make sure that we're using those manufacturer's instructions. That way, when we do go to court, we'll say, yes, I did do this. I did this, this, and that. I have my inspection report to, rep to prove this, this, and that. My hands are clean from this. There's no gross negligence. I've done everything to the T. This is an accident. And thankfully, you'll be exonerated and get to walk out of the courtroom. I just want to see you guys win. Let's go ahead and get to it. All right, y'all, let's take a look at the first one. It's electric vehicle coupler. It's in 625.10A through D. And this is exactly what we're talking about here. We're talking about the connector and the inlet. When they're paired together, then it's coupled. So let's take a look at A. What A is talking about is that it needs to be constructed so that it will never have inadvertent contact by persons with the live parts from the electric vehicle equipment or the vehicle battery. So this whole thing needs to be constructed. And listen, this lesson's mostly about construction from the manufacturer, but we need to be well-versed to make sure there's been no modifications afterward or that it's not broken or something's missing. So it needs to be constructed here in part A so that you can never come in contact with the energized parts. If you notice, it's very well protected here, and then it slides in. It has a, you know two more layers of protection here. So that's just something we have to make sure that the people are safe at all times. Part B says unintentional disconnect. And what it's talking about is the electric vehicle connector not act, just flopping around. You want to make sure that it can't accidentally get pulled out if someone accidentally trips on it or tugs on it when they're in there or some other scenario like that. So we have to make sure that this right here is solid and that it's not going to inadvertently become disconnected. Part C is talking about the grounding pole. It says electric vehicle coupler shall be provided with a grounding pole, so a grounding you know, lug or terminal, unless provided as part of a listed isolated electrical vehicle system. So it has to have the grounding plug installed here. We talked about that previously, didn't we? To make sure it's well grounded. There's going to be other things going on with the grounding system, but it has to reference off of that ground. Part D says grounding pole requirements. If a grounding pole is provided, the electric vehicle coupler shall be designed so that the grounding pole connection is the first to make and the last to break contact. So it's likely going to be sticking out a little bit farther. So it's the first one to make contact when it's plugged in, and it's the last one to be broken when it leaves. We want to make sure that that ground is intact the entire time of the coupling process. That way, no one gets hurt. So that covers all of our construction equipment specifications for the electric vehicle coupler. All right, the second thing that we have to take a look at is markings, and this is in 625.15A through C. Part A says, all equipment shall be marked by the manufacturer as follows, for use with electric vehicles. So from the panel over to the electric vehicle supply equipment, we're going to use Chapter 3 wiring methods. When we get to that EVSE, maybe a Stage 2 charger, Level 2 charger, from that point on, everything has to be labeled and identified for use with electric vehicles. It's super important, so we can't just pull anything off the shelf. We can't just pull anything off of Amazon. We have to make sure that it is listed and labeled for that. Part B and C go together. It's talking about ventilation required. So part B is about ventilation not required. It says that manufacturers must clearly state whether ventilation is or is not required for this electric vehicle charger. And this is what we're talking about here. It says ventilation not required on the left, on this left hand one right here. It says ventilation not required. On the right hand one, it says for use only with electric vehicles not requiring ventilation. If yours does require ventilation and it is allowed to be used indoors, if there is ventilation required and ventilation installed and it's listed to be used indoors, then you can use it. But the code goes on to state here that if there is ventilation required, it's required to be mechanical ventilation. And you can get more clarification over here in 
it's talking about the ventilation that it must be mechanical and it actually goes into specs there talking about how many i think it's in cubic meters or cubic feet per minute of air must be moved so you must have you must have a mechanical means to circulate the air out and also make up air to come back in number three is going to be short and sweet it says cords and cables this is in 625.17 a through c this is what we're talking about this is going to be the power supply cable this is going to be the output cable to the electric vehicle like we learned last week and the biggest thing that we want to watch out for in this section is in part c it's talking about the overall length of the usable cable it's not to exceed 25 feet unless it's equipped with a cable management system so unless you have something that is managing or helping you manage the cable that overall cable is not allowed to be longer than 25 feet we're going to do four and five together because they're really a pair so the first one is interlock it's 625.18 and the second one is automatic de-energization of cable which is 625.19 and i looked in the 2020 code and couldn't find either one of these i wonder why they've taken out or maybe they've moved it i didn't spend a lot of time looking around but what we're talking about here is this so this is our connector this is our inlet and when they're together they are coupled let's go ahead and read 625.18 it says electric vehicle supply equipment shall be provided with an interlock that de-energizes the electrical vehicle connector whenever the electrical connector is uncoupled from the electric vehicle and then it goes on to say a couple times that it's not required and it's on like the 15 and 20 amp level one versions or any um setup that is 60 volts dc or less what manufacturers have to do and how they accomplish it is through these ports and um our switch here and then they may have other technologies i love in the code here it doesn't specify whether hardware does this software does this contacts do it so it really leaves it up to the manufacturer but it uses the proximity pilot and it also uses the control status which monitors and what it does is when you go to push this button it automatically de-energizes this connection right here because they know that if you're pushing this button you're likely connecting to the power or disconnecting and they don't want a gap there also if this were to get accidentally pulled out or if somebody were to jerk on it or a kid were to yank on it we want to make sure that it's not going to have any potential to harm someone at the same time with the automatic de-energization of the cable if there's ever anything frayed or if there's a fault in the cable somewhere they have to have things in place from the manufacturer that are able to detect this and de-energize the cable i do want to note that it is called in 625 an interlock there are other interlocks inside of the electric vehicle that de-energize parts that's not what we're talking about here we're talking about the uh, de-energy or the connector interlock at this point in the electric vehicle there's going to be interlocks when you go to work on it there's going to be interlocks when you shut off the vehicle it's going to open up contactors and interlock to where it de-energizes the dc voltage off of the components inside the car also there are things in place that if you get in a car accident it has an interlock where it'll de-energize the dc voltage so it's not a hazard during the accident so there are multiple interlocks inside of the electric vehicle but this interlock is specifically talking about the relationship between the connector the inlet and when they are coupled all right and 625.22 says personnel protection system this just reiterates and makes it code that they are required on EVSE to have this personnel protection system. And what this is, is gonna be ground sensing, also working with the GFCI technology and any other technology, whether hardware or software, that they have in place in order to keep people from being shocked or electrocuted while using their electric vehicle. Finally, getting into the meat of this master series, we're gonna be looking at load calculations for electric vehicles before we get started i just want to remind you guys not to repeat anything in these videos just use them for educational purposes only you know i just want to see you guys win and part of you continuing to win and excel in this industry and be legitimate and be respected is you playing by the rules so you got to pull permits on all these projects and make sure that you're installing them to the t i hope you get a lot of value from this video today and i'm super excited about it let's get to it all right, so before we start looking at some real world scenarios, we're gonna lay the foundations with some EV calculation basics. We're gonna start in 625.41, and then we're gonna jump into 625.42. Six, 
25.41 says overcurrent protection must be calculated at 125% of the maximum load of the equipment. And at face value, you might be like, ooh, what about these level two chargers that you can set at 32 amps or at 20 amps or at 40 amps? And so if you're totally new to the concept, there are level two chargers that you can actually dial up or down. Some of them are smart and you know can be programmed in that way. Some of them are remotely controlled or it can be in a setting that is controlled by authorized persons only. And we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. But basically, a level two charger, a lot of them, you can set it up for 20 amps. You can set it up for 30 amps, 32 amps, 40 amps, respectively. And they go larger than that. With the same unit, you can have all those different amperage levels, depending on the size service that you have and also how you've wired it. But this code here, if you read it at face value, it says that they must be calculated at the maximum load of the equipment. And if you do not have a piece of equipment that can be adjusted, that is the case. But there are some catches to those equipment that can be adjusted and dialing down their service size. Let's go ahead and read 625.42. We're going to read it in the 17 and then we're going to see how they clarified it in the 2020. It says the equipment shall have sufficient rating to supply the load served. Electric vehicle charging load shall be considered a continuous load for the purpose of this article, which should be a given because it's going to run for expected to run for three or more hours. It says where automatic load management systems are used, the maximum equipment load on the service or feeder shall be allowed to be calculated by the automatic load management system. I'm going to read it now in the 2020. It really cleans it up. Every code cycle, it cleans it up, and I look for the 2023 to be even cleaner. It says electric vehicle supply equipment with restricted access to an amper, ampere adjustment shall be allowed to be sized according to the let, let me just say it in, in plain terminology here it's saying that if you do have a piece of equipment that has limited access to that adjustment meaning taking it from a 32 amp to a 40 amp version if it has limited access you are allowed to size your service and feeders and their overcurrent protection based off of that limited number so if i have somebody with a tesla charger at home and it is a model that does 20, 32, and 40, and I dial it down to 32, and the customer has limited access to that adjustment, then I can actually size my overcurrent and my wire based off of that 32 amps multiplied by 1.25. Does that make sense? It goes on here in the 2020 code says that you have to have at least one of these three things that are protecting a homeowner from just cranking it up when you leave. Because that's what we don't want. You set a homeowner up with what they need. Let's say you've done a load calc and they can only handle 32 amps. You set the homeowner up with what they need. And the moment you leave, they go over to a dial and crank it up to 40. Well, the conductors aren't sized correctly. Overcurrent protection isn't sized correctly. And maybe the service isn't sized correctly. So the code book prescribes three ways that this can be done. One is a covered door that requires the use of an open tool. So these adjustments are going to typically be inside somewhere or controlled by software. It says locked doors that are accessible only to qualified personnel. So if you had a commercial setting and there was a locked door that was only available by maintenance and he had the ability to control those dials, making it a 32 amp version or a 40 amp version respectively, then that is one method that counts. Or if it says it has pro pro password protected commissioning software accessible only to qualified personnel. So there must be some of these units on larger scales that you can actually change that setting through software remotely. So let's say they can get into it and they can make it a 32 amp version or they can make it a 40 amp version. And you may be dealing with much larger versions when it's being done remotely. So I'm thankful for 625.42. It says the calculation of the load can be based off the setting of the automatic management system as long as it has limited access. I do want to note when it comes to sizing conductors directly, 625 does not mention it specifically, and I'm really surprised for that. I look for that to come. Although you would go back to everything previously that you learned in the code, and this load is expected to run for three or more hours, so you're going to have to take that known load, let's say it's a 32 amp version, and you're going to have to multiply that by 1.25 in order to size your conductors. In this case, it states it specifically in 625.41 that you must do that 125%, but it doesn't call out the branch circuit or feeder directly. 
although previous parts of the code are going to require you to do the 125% rule on this load because it's expected to run for three or more hours. Now let's imagine that we have three different size chargers and we're going to size the overcurrent protection or we have a model that allows us to dial it to three different levels. So let's go ahead and take a look at it now. So let's say that the uh, first model is a 32 amp version. We would take that 32 amps, multiply it by 1.25. That would give us a new amp draw to size our wire by and also our overcurrent protection. So first we would head to 240.6a and we would pick the next standard size breaker. And in this case, it happens to be a 40. Let's imagine we have the 40 amp version. We would take 40 multiplied by 1.25. That would be our new known load that we would size our wire by. Then we would head over to 240.6a, which is our standard ampere rating breakers and fuses table. And we would select a 50 amp because it happens to be a standard size. Then let's imagine that we had the 50 amp version. We'd have to take it, multiply it by 1.25. That would give us a new known load of 62.5 amps to size our wire and our overcurrent protection device by. We would flip over to 240.6a and we would choose the next standard size. And I'm always, I always want to go there and check. And sure enough, it jumps straight from 60 to 70. So the 50 amp version would actually end up on a 70 amp overcurrent device. But we could size our wire based off the known maximum load, which in this case is going to be 62.5 amps. All right, so let's imagine that we have an existing customer. And that customer sees a commercial on TV for the brand new Tesla truck without thinking about it, just orders the Tesla truck and doesn't have any worries about being able to charge or maintain it. Well, when the vehicle gets there, they realize that they're going to need a level two charger. So they call you up. They say, hey, I've got my house. I've got my vehicle here. Help me. I need you to come install this level two charger. Well, there's some pre-qualifying questions that we're going to have to ask the customer before we can just run over there and install it. First thing that we're going to need to figure out is what size is the customer's current electrical service? We're going to say that for this scenario that the customer has a 225 amp electrical service. So now we need to ask some qualifying questions because we cannot just go over and install this thing without doing a proper load calculation. So we ask the customer how many square feet their home is, if it has one kitchen, one laundry room. In this case, the customer does have two dryers no gas appliances. So we are, you know, good electrical code coaches. We've been doing this for a while. We've took the exam coach. We know how to do a load calculation on the back of a Hardy's bag inside the truck. So we bust out that load count. We go ahead and knock it all out. We do our general. We do our small appliances. We do our fixed appliances. We calculate for our two dryers, our range, our heating. We total that up, divide that by 240, and that gives us 214.64 amps. So we only have about 10 amps left to play with on this service. So it's a 225 amp service. It's a calculated load of 214 amps. So we're only going to be allowed to put a 10 amp charger on this system. Well, I can tell you right now, they probably make in, they probably make level one plug-in chargers that go up to 12.5 amps, maybe even up higher to 16. So with that being said, we know for certain that this customer cannot install a level two charger on their home. And we are being very generous in this load calc. So let's go here to the kitchen small appliances. I only figured for two kitchen circuits and one laundry circuit. How many kitchens have you been in lately that only have two circuits? Most of them have five circuits. And for each one of those circuits, we would have to calculate the 1500 VAs. And if we calculated those in, it's probably already going to be right at that 225, if not more. So in this case, this customer would actually have to have a service upgrade before they could even do their level two charger, anything less than, you know, above 10 amps. So it's super important for us and for your career and for your livelihood that you don't just go out and stall in chargers without doing a load calculation. You have to calculate the load. Now you can do it very quickly like this on the back of a Hardy's bag inside your truck. I'm fine with that. But your inspector is going to ask you or should be asking you, what is the load calc on this thing on the home? What's the pre-existing load? And then you need to go back and you have to calculate the new load at 125%. So if you did want to install a 32 amp charger on this one, you'd have to multiply it by 1.25. That would give you 40 
And you have to count that amp for amp. And I think that's where a lot of people get lost on these chargers. There is no reduction of load. You actually have to increase the load by 125%. And then you have to count that amp for amp. So for in order for this customer here to be able to put that 40 amp charger, let's go ahead and do here and do the math real quick. We would be 225 minus 40. His load calc would have to be 185 amps before you get there. That's on a 225 service. So you have to be very careful when you are installing these chargers that the customer service is adequate. If they have a 200 amp service minus 40, they would have to have only a 160 amp known load on this thing in order to be able to install it. So make sure if you're going to an average home that has a 200 amp circuit breaker, okay, that you are doing the load calc. So you're taking the general square foot, you're taking everything, adding it all up, making sure that if you're installing a 32 amp or larger, that you have only 160 amps on the known calculated load. Your inspector is going to want to see that calculation, maybe. If not, he's at least going to, he or she's going to at least want to know that you did it and understand intellectually what's going on. So you couldn't go to a home that has a 180 amp load already on it and install a 32 amp charger. You'd have to multiply that by 1.25. That would give you 40 and you would be at 120 amps. You're going to need a service upgrade. So many of these homes and customers don't realize when the heat of the moment, they're at the dealership or they're watching online. You can order them online now. And they order these things that there could be a serious electrical job that has to come with it. I've had to break many people's hearts and let them know that their current electrical service is not adequate for their EV charger. I did it recently at a commercial project where they wanted to install 250 amp chargers on a 60 amp service. So it was literally, um, it ended up being 50 after the 1.25. So it was the 40 amp versions. It literally ended up being 50 amps per charger. They wanted both of them. Well, this structure was only fed with 60 amps. So that was not in the cards. And I had to break the bad news to them. And they called, it was so funny. They called several of our colleagues trying to get different opinions. And everybody gave them all the same opinion that, hey, it's just not going to work. So just want you guys to be aware of this. This is super important. I hope you learned something today about calculating these loads. There are lots of different scenarios. Just make sure you're multiplying the known load by 125%. That's going to give you your new known load to size your wire and your overcurrent protection by. Remember, always work with your electrical inspector, 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 Sean Connery. Always work with your electrical inspector and make sure that you're pulling permits on every project. All right, y'all, I'm really excited about today's video, talking about inside uh, installations for EV chargers. And we're going to learn about a couple different scenarios and a couple ways to tackle it. But before we ever get started on an EV install, there's some qualifying questions that I'm going to be asking the homeowner, or if you're a homeowner or an electrician wanting to do this self, you're going to be asking these yourself. So let's imagine that a homeowner calls me, you know, first estimate, hey, I want to install my electrical vehicle charger. The first thing I'm going to ask them is, do you already have the unit? Do you have the unit that I'm going to install? Because I'm either going to want to see it, see a picture of it, you know, sent from the customer, or and I'm definitely going to want the spec sheet of it. That's going to determine how much I charge based on wire size and all these different things. And the main thing I want to see is this is this unit brand new. Now, from an electrician standpoint, I am not going to install a used electric charger vehicle unit unless I pulled it off the wall at one residence and I put it back on at the other just how I'm doing it. And if you're a homeowner and you're buying an EV, you know, charger, don't buy a used one. You know, don't go rasco on the charger, just get you a new one. Let's, you know, that's my first question. Do you have the unit already? Cause that's going to tell me a lot of things. Is it rated for indoors, outdoors? Is it required to be vented? All of these different questions are going to be answered. What type of type and quality of product am I using? I really don't want to install a junky one, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? I want to install a quality brand. That way I know that I can guarantee my work and have no trouble. The second thing I'm going to ask is how long is your cord? So are you going to go with the 20 foot cord, the 25 foot cord or a larger co uh, cord? Now the NEC specifies 25 feet or less for your cord unless, remember it's a national exception code, unless that cord is a part of a listed assembly that has a retracting device on it, a cord management kit system, or is, has one that you can add onto it that is listed with that assembly. So you can have a longer cord. So I want to know how long is your cord? And some of these questions I'm going to ask over the phone, some of them I'm going to be asking in person, but these are all pre-qualifying questions before we start turning a wrench. 
because I want to know what side of the garage they're going to be on. And we're going to cover that here in just a second. But their cord is going to determine, you know, where, where I put it. Am I putting it inside? Am I putting it outside? That's going to, you know, determine a lot of things. The next question that we're going to want to ask them is, do they want it inside or outside? So you could put it on the outside right on this face wall. You could put it out here. And some, some people uh, park outside. They may not even want to do it inside at all and may want it completely outside. So then I'm asking, you know, making sure that it's um, uh, listed for outdoor installation, all of these other things, you know, before we ever get started. Also, if it's indoors, you know, the next question that we're going to ask, what side of the garage do you want it located on? So if the panel's right here, you know, can I put it right here or right there? And we're going to talk about that tomorrow. But if they are set and determined to have it over here, we're going to talk about what you do in that scenario. So if I'm looking at this from just a practical standpoint and I'm talking with a customer, let's imagine we're standing here in the garage and they want it on the inside and everything's fun and exciting and we're taking a look at it. And they're like, oh, I really want it over here. Well, I know what it's going to take to get it over there. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow or in the coming days in this series. So I may tell them the price of having it over here. And they may say, never mind, can you put it over here? But if they are absolutely adamant on ha having it over here, let them know what the cost is going to be. And we're going to talk about some ways that you can execute that on the later videos in this series. And the next question that we're going to want to ask, is there enough space inside of this panel? So am I going to have to come in and move some things around in order to even have enough space to install it? Is this panel maxed out completely? Am I, am I not going to be able to move some things around? So that's just some questions. Just because the panel's full does not mean that the panel's maxed out, okay? There's some things that you can do, special breakers that you can buy to buy yourself a couple of spaces. And I have videos all about that on the DIY and the Electrical Code Coach channel. And the next question I'm gonna ask is, the electrical service big enough? So you have to calculate this uh, demand at 125%. So let's say you had the 48 amp version, you have to multiply that by 1.25, and that is going to give you 60 amps. Well, is this panel already maxed out? Do I have a hot tub, two water heaters, two kitchens on a little low 200 amp or maybe even a 100 amp service? Can this service even handle this electric vehicle load? Some of these electric vehicle chargers used to go up to 80, you know, 80 amps. And I look for them, some of them to come back and you may still be able to purchase them. But typically now they've dialed it down to you know right around 60 amps which is a pretty average load you know and typically can be added to most services but i've installed them as large as 80 amps and it's like hmm you know is can that 80 amp load really go on this 100 amp service especially if you multiply it at 125 percent it's just one of the things that you have to consider we're going to consider all these things these are pre-qualifying questions before we ever get started do you have the unit already? How long is your cord? Do you want it inside or outside? What side of the garage do you want it located on? Is there enough space in the panel? And is the electrical service big enough? So these are just some things that we're going to want to consider. And as far as pricing goes, what is my path? You know, if we're putting it right here, I got a pretty easy path. If we're putting it over here, I may or may not have an easy path. Are they going to be okay with surface mount conduit if, I, if they do want it somewhere else? If I have to do it over here, is there an attic up above or am I going to have to surface mount conduit on the wall all the way up and over there? So lots of different things can change the price dramatically, can change whether or not you even want to do the job, you know, tackle the job. You also want to call your inspector and see, hey, you know, get, kind of get on page with them. Make sure that you have a, a vent free version of charger, which you're likely going to have. And there's just, you know, this is one of those installs that it's kind of a, a picky install where there's so many different things that have to come together. I've got to make sure that I have my workspace. I've got to make sure that you know, I'm code compliant on my conductors and overcurrent, all of my chapter three wiring methods. So you just take your time and dive back I know and it may sound cumbersome you know if you've never installed one of these thinking about having to do all this once you do a few I can I can somebody can call me I can literally tell them typically over the phone the price how much it's gonna cost you know and when we can come do it so you just get to you know learn these things I just want you to learn the slow way that way as you're dealing with this you're dealing with customers you know you're uh, looking you you look and feel more confident so I want you to have all these things in the pocket so when you go out to sell this job to a customer you're prepared and you're ready to give them a pro job the most popular way that you're probably going to be installing them is going to be something that looks like this remember never repeating the thing in these videos just using for educational purposes only so this has got the unit separated just to show you kind of how it clicks together this is the wall base okay and this is kind of the the interface in the front so let's go ahead and take a deeper look at this right here all right this is the back of this unit and this is the 
the front of this unit right here. So this is the piece that's going to clip against the wall. Very simple to wire, depending on yours. You know, always pull out your manufacturer's instructions. You know, this one's going to be a line side here, probably line side here and a ground right here, but always follow every one of them set up a little bit different. So it's super simple to install. Typically just three wires. I haven't seen any yet that need a neutral. Doesn't mean they won't need them in the future. All right, so let's look a little bit closer at this thing here. So this, if you notice this right here and this right here, they just clip in respectively. Pretty simple. You screw this to the wall, mount it. They give you a template. Stupid easy. All right, and then you clip that in. Then you clip this in, and really you're done. But we're going to talk in a minute how to get from point A to point B. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at this a little bit closer here. All right, so let's talk about the ways that we're going to be entering into the wall mounting portion. So we can use a unibit or any other, you know, method that you feel like can get a nice hole. A unibit's probably the easiest way to do it. But you can actually punch a hole right here, punch a hole right here, or you could, if you notice, you can come in the top or in the bottom right here. So there's lots of different options depending on your scenario. All right, so let's imagine that we're going to be installing this one right here. Yours may be a different model. doesn't really matter. Let's go ahead and dive into it. And let's say that we can put it right here now there's some codes that we have to watch out for here and depending on your electrical inspector all the electrical inspectors that i know will allow electrical equipment as long as it's for electrical equipment above and below the panel now there's some codes you got to watch out there it can't stick out more than six inches and you'll find this in 110.26 a3 i believe it is you'll have to go look that up but it cannot stick out more than six inches right here um, if you read that code carefully some inspectors might say hey it has to be associated with the panel to go above or below it but every inspector that i know allows electrical equipment of any kind above or below as long as it doesn't stick out more than six inches or encroach on the workspace in some other way all right so the easiest way to do it um, and that's why i always ask the customer what type of equipment they're installing you know and you know what the scenario is so as long as this unit isn't deeper than six inches which i don't believe they are because i've put them underneath it before um, you know, and always just measure a unit, pull a tape measure out. As long as it doesn't stick out more than six inches, you're good to go. But the easiest way to do it is we can use this knockout hole right here, right? You know, the let's, we're assuming that this panel is recessed into the wall, which most panels in a garage nowadays that are finished are going to be. And what we're going to do is, is we're going to pop, we're going to cut a little service hole back here. We're going to fish up into the panel, nice and easy. And then we're going to pop right into the back of this hole, screw it to the wall and literally be done. Now you're going to want to set, offset your stud to where you know you, you're screwing part you know you're screwing into the stud there so you've got a rock solid connection but i mean that's probably the easiest way that's why i always ask the customer you know what type of equipment do you have what are we installing you know i want a picture of in front of the panel if the customer is capable of sending it if not you know you can go out do a uh you know an on-site you know take a look at it just to make sure also know what your inspector is going to say about it being underneath there but that's probably the fastest and easiest way the least expensive way to hook up this electrical vehicle charger very simple as far as wiring goes but the logistics and electrical Electrical is always what you pay for, right? You pay for how to get it from point A to point B. The rest of it is just technical stuff. So let's take a look at, let's say either the workspace, your customer, or the inspector wants you to put it over here. Well, how do you tackle that? Well, thankfully, there's holes in the top and in the bottom. Now, technically, technically, if this was a garage, okay, and there was an attic above it, you could, you know, fish up in the wall go over here fish down into this plate and fish it down but i always try to coach the customer in the least expensive way because i might have you know who knows it could be an hour could be three hours depending on how hard the fishing is to get in the panel get in the wall get up in the attic drill down drill over and it might be 30 minutes and it might be three hours you guys know what i'm talking about if there's blockers in the wall or all kinds of different you know things so potentially you could fish up over down and pop in the back again and keep it all you know, nice and concealed. But typically, I'm going to try to lead the customers in the least expensive way. And in this case, it's going to be to surface mount conduit. So whether you use EMT, maybe you want to use Greenfield if your inspector's okay with it, maybe a piece of MC if your inspector's okay with it, or some EMT or PVC, what you would do is, is you could, you know, and the, this transition here is probably your hardest part. So I would probably set a four square box right here underneath the panel. And what I would do is, is fish my wire up into here, into the panel, down in the four square box and then surface mount conduit from the four square box over here to the unit i like using some type of flex because you know flexible conduit because it allows me to come down nice and easy i can find my studs put my straps in easy peasy right so there's several different ways that you could do this surface mount 
is going to be probably the least expensive way. All right, and what we're going to look at today is the cord and plug connected version. So you are literally going to plug this in and it's going to energize this, which is going to energize this and everything is going to be legit. As long as you followed all of your chapter three wiring methods, your uh, manufacturer's instructions, installations, and all the other NEC code. So remember never repeating thing in these videos, just use them for educational purposes only. So when you get all finished, it's going to look something like this, right? So we have our receptacle over here. It just cord and plug connects in. We're going to mount this to the wall using the template. Nice and easy. No big deal. So let's go ahead and jump into the installation process. So the easiest place to put this, as long as your inspector is okay with it, is putting it right underneath the panel. And there's a couple different ways that we can tackle this. Now, if your inspector is not okay with it being right underneath the panel, just move either one of these methods over, which would, in, you know, in <laughs> then shift your charger over a little bit too. But either way, it's going to be pretty easy to install, either in the bay right next to the panel, as long as you have the workspace. And right here underneath, it's going to be the easiest one if your inspector is okay with it. So let's talk about a couple ways to get this done. So probably the easiest way to do it, in my opinion, would be to use a two-gang cut-in box. Now, I've taught you in previous videos how to install these boxes, but what these are is this box here has these two tabs right here. See this tab and this tab down here? So what you'll do is you'll lay this facing the drywall and very carefully trace out this section here and the sides. You're going to trace it out on the drywall. Then you're going to take your knife and you're going to cut it in. Now, you're going to be super careful because there's going to be wires coming out from the bottom of this panel, most likely. And you've got to be super careful not to cut into any of those wires. And I'm probably going to choose a place right in the middle of that wall. That way I'm not hugging the stud where some wires can be stapled and I may not be dealing with a large line. Also, you have to watch out is your service entrance pipe coming in through the bottom. So there's a lot of things that you got to watch out for. But if you take this and cut this in nice and neat, these little tabs will draw against the drywall and this will actually be a flush mount you know, situation where when you end up, it's nice and smooth against the drywall. And you're going to use a face plate like this. So the only thing protruding is going to be just the width of a face plate. And then you're literally, your receptacle would be right here. You're going to plug that thing in. And that's probably going to be the cleanest, neatest way to install it. But you may not be able to do that. It may be crowded beneath the panel inside the drywall. You may have the service entrance conductors coming in and don't feel comfortable cutting in the wall. Well, there's another way to do it, and it's going to be using a four square box. Now, this is a metal box. It's a box that we use all the time for tons of different methods. And what you could actually do, if your inspector is okay with it, is take this and surface mount it right underneath the panel. I would find a stud to favor on one side. See, on both sides of this panel, there's going to be a stud on both sides. And what you're going to want to do is find one of those sides and you're going to be able to mount your box. Now, the how you come into the box is probably going to be through one of these back holes. So I would cut me a little pilot hole right here, and then you're going to fish your wire up in here into a de-energized panel. Then you're going to come in, and you're going to pop right in the back of one of these holes and surface mount that box. And it's actually going to protrude out from the wall just about the depth of this plus this right here, which is actually going to be your cover. And it gives you a very industrial look. So your receptacle would be here. This is your cover. It's a very cool look. It's called a four square box and an RS cover. Now, naturally, with either one of those scenarios, you're just going to mount your or your charger, whatever brand it is. You're just going to mount it right over here. Customer comes up. This is plugged in all the time. They've got their cord retrieval system. Boom, they plug their car in. No big deal. If the inspector is not happy with it being right there and he wants it in the bay, he or she wants it in the bay right there, just scoot the receptacle over a little bit, scoot the charger over a little bit, and you are good to go. So this is the scenario where you're doing the cord and plug connected version. There's you know a lot of different scenarios that it could be. You could have a surface mount panel, and, and then you would just do a surface mount receptacle probably. So whatever scenario you're facing, they sell a box, a fitting, or some setup to satisfy whatever you're facing. Hey, y'all, that's it for today.